Well, and there used to be a, a time when it was frowned upon to make pipes. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't remember, and that's, it's not been that long ago. No, it was like five years ago. Like, <laughs> right? Yeah, five years ago, there were there were guys that that you didn't even you didn't tell them you were a pipe maker. Yeah. It wasn't cool to be a pipe maker. Yeah. You uh, you made beads and marbles and pendants and whatever you could fucking make to put out on the table and you kept the pipes under the table. Yeah, exactly. And now you could probably put the pipes on the table. Yeah, and put the beads under the table in the case. <laughs> Just stop making the beads yeah, that too. all together <laughs> and don't even think about like bring a handful of beads to the table. I don't know, but seriously, yeah. uh, I it's uh, the it's changed. Oh, it, the game has changed significantly. It went from uh, from people calling us fucking pipe makers to oh, holy shit, you make pipes? Yeah. Oh my god, you're a fucking pipe. Right. Maker. Yeah. Total, totally different. Yeah. Expression yeah. Of fuck. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. All right, dude. Our levels are good. All right, you ready? I'm ready. This is the Wise Guy Radio Show podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. We will be dissecting their journeys in hopes to deliver actionable content that you, the artist, can start implementing now, helping you grow not only as a creative spirit, but also a successful artistic entrepreneur. With a little organization, relationship building, and your artistic ability, you can obtain greatness. Climb aboard, whether an artist retail owner or enthusiast we have a ton of fun in store for you welcome to the wise guy radio show this episode of the wise guy radio show was brought to you by green flash glass the green flash glass logo is a symbol of quality because they take pride in their craftsmanship and stand behind their products made in the usa green flash glass builds relationships based on trust integrity and respect With over 15 years of experience and an amazing team of artists, Green Flash Glass backs up their work with 100% quality guarantee, friendly responsive customer service, and high quality products at an affordable price. For more info, go to greenflashglass.com. That's greenflashglass.com. I am in the middle of listening to my free audio book I downloaded at audibletrial.com forward slash wise guy radio and that's W-Y-Z-G-U-I radio. The reason I'm saying this is because if you want to be a part of our book club that we're doing, which is our audio book club, uh, why not go to and download your free 30-day trial at audibletrial.com uh, where they have over 180,000 plus publications, magazines, books, all kind of good stuff. Uh, and figure since you guys are listening to this podcast, you obviously listen to uh, downloadable audio on your phones or iPads or computers. Go to audibletrial.com, audible, audible, audibletrial.com forward slash wise guy radio, audibletrial.com forward slash wise guy radio. And that's a u d i b l e t r i a l dot com forward slash w y z g u y radio dot com. What is going on? Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show, episode numero cinquenta uno. This is Jay Michael, your host. I am super pumped up to be with you guys today, and thank you so much for tuning in. I figure with 17 years of glass experience behind the torch and a shit ton of failures and successes and all these fun conversations of artists and their same similar stories, it's going to be a fun journey for us all to go through and learn valuable lessons and grow as artistic entrepreneurs as we really become influenced and inspired by each other and our community as we all grow and ultimately find what this ideal lifestyle is that we all truly want. And as individual humans, we all have our own story and our own dreams, so My goal and my dream as I do this with you guys is not only to learn from the people that we talk to and listen to, uh, but also learn from you guys, the audience. So thank you so much for tuning in and being here with me and all the feedback and stuff you guys have given me. It is an honor to be here doing this show. I also want to give you guys another little heads up. Uh, This week's newsletter I am putting out towards the end of the week. Uh, This show is coming out on, see, it's 
Monday night I'm recording this, so the show will be out Tuesday morning. So Thursday, Friday this week, which is basically the end of the month, the newsletter is coming out for the week, and I will have a little special thing on there giving you information, telling you how I am going to be giving you all a special thank you for doing something specifically uh, for me in the show. And uh, it's about a five-minute process that will take you, and uh, through this process, then you and I will uh, come together, and I'll give you a big thank you but you got to find out what that thank you is and how to go about it by signing up for our newsletter at wiseguyradio.com and you'll get all that insight and information there as well. And to my Instagram, I am going to uh, be doing a 10K giveaway as like near 10,000 followers. And so stay tuned for that as well. Uh, all you out there, anybody follow me on Instagram? If you're not yet, my Instagram is at J Michael Glass. That's J M I C H A E L Glass. And uh, I do a lot of fun stuff out there in glass and whatever, so you get to see my little crazy life besides the podcast on there. Um, but again, super pumped to be here. Uh, this interview with uh, coming up is with glass artist Josh Hamra. Uh, he is a really awesome dude, super big heart, really chill, had a fun, just kind of casual conversation about him and his life and living out in Arizona and being a glass artist, and actually a second-generation glass artist, so we get into some uh, details, kind of some insight into his beginnings and where he's at now and why he does what he does. And uh, he's also uh, just, like I said, just super cool family guy. He's got a little baby on the way. He's already got one now. Uh, just It was fun, and uh, I'm very envious of his amazing beard that he is getting ready to trim for Halloween, which you guys will hear about that as well. Also, don't forget this coming up next episode. I am going to be doing our first introduction part. Well, I guess we already did the introduction, so it's our first part in our new series, our audiobook series, uh, where we are covering the 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. And this particular episode, I am going to be going over what is step one in the book. Uh, it's basically... Uh, he has an anagram that they made, uh, or he made, using the word deal. And there's four parts to this. And it's D is for de- definition, E is for elimination, A is for automation, and L is for liberation. So the D for definition part is what I'm going to be sharing with you guys, as there are several questions in this uh, this uh, write-up and also in the audiobook that he goes over um, that you guys should also follow along. Um, I'll give them to you real quick if you haven't listened to it yet, but I still recommend that you listen to it and not just listen to me talking about these questions. But basically, with the first exercise from this section is you spend five minutes and define your dream. If it wasn't for the things you had to do, what would you be doing with your life right now? Write that down in five, after really five minutes or so. And then spend another five minutes and define your nightmare in as much detail as possible. What is the absolute worst thing that could happen if you followed that dream? And then the third and final question is, if you take the dream and compare it to the nightmare, is that possible nightmare really bad enough to abandon your dream? So those are the three uh, questions that I'm going to be answering, and I'm going to be sharing my answers with you guys and going into little details about it and where I'm at. Uh, Because, again, this is not only just for you guys. This is also for me. You know, I'm kind of growing along with you guys, even though I've been uh, behind the torch for, like I said, close to 17 years now and... um, I, you know, life is awesome. Uh, in certain areas of my life, I'm still working on and all my money and making that and balancing budgets and, you know, running a studio and or sharing a studio. You know, there's all kind of trials and tribulations that I'm, st- I'm still going through uh, as I grow through this new venture that I've kind of rebranded myself about three years ago when I started the whole wise guy concept and brand. Um, so, you know, I think it's kind of fun that we all kind of grow together and come January of next year of 2016, I'm going to be starting the Wise Guy Radio, the Wise Guy Radio Mastermind Groups. And basically the idea is there'll be uh, myself in the middle and three or four other of you at a time in groups uh, where through Skype or another different versions of doing video conferencing, we can sit around and talk about the struggles that we're going through in our glass or in uh, the business or whatever, like any kind of topics that you think that you would want to cover, uh, we'll definitely will cover. And, uh, each, each session will be an hour long once a week. So maybe, maybe every other week, depend on whose schedules or what, but the idea is, uh, to start the idea and the concept of really working with each other, uh, in a manner, uh, with, especially when it's with people that you don't necessarily know right off the bat, but through these processes of these groups, you really get to know each other. Um, and you know, it's kind of a fun thing, but we're going to kind of put it together and, um, I'm in the process right now of putting my own together here and uh, go through this process. I'm, I'm in a couple already, but one that is actually strictly involved with glass, I'm not. And that's what I'm putting together right now. So as I 
uh, help put this together and we go through our process. Uh, we'll, I'll be writing notes and taking notes on how to make this as successful for you guys as possible so we can all work together. So it's going to be pretty fun. Um, and, uh, yeah, so other than that, just make sure you guys go again to wiseguyradio.com, subscribe to the newsletter, and uh, get our fun in, inside the secrets kind of stuff going behind the scenes and pictures and news and notes and downloads and checklists and all kind of fun shit. Uh, the website's still in progress. Uh, all you Florida peeps, especially those in South Florida, I will be in uh, Fort Lauderdale area. Uh, November 15th, I will be at the LSD Gallery. It's uh, Sunday. Yeah, they got a little wine and cheese going on. I'll be there doing a new glass drop, some new styles and models that I got coming out this year uh, for the Christmas season, and also some new pendant styles I got coming out, and some merch as well for all you guys, and also a full demonstration there in their back of their store. So looking forward to that. It's my fourth year doing it with these guys, and it's always an honor to go down there and be part of the South Florida family. I got a giant following down there, and I love all you guys, and you guys have kind of been the one that got this wise guy thing started from the beginning uh, with the support of it and it's been pretty cool so I really appreciate you know the Florida family but I also appreciate y'all worldwide that are tuning in and listening to this and that have also helped me along the ways over these 17 years and also in the past six months as I've been doing this podcast so uh, as you guys can probably hear my voice is uh, my voice is getting a little tired so I'm gonna say goodbye let you guys go because I've been rambling on for almost 10 minutes here and I'm sure you're tired of hearing me rambling so love you guys See you all on 52. Don't forget to download your free audio book at audibletrial.com forward slash wise guy radio. Get your free 30 day trial and a audio book on there and might as well download the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss and join the, join this conversation. So and again, if you have any questions or comments or want to give me kind of any insight into your answers, because I will be asking for you guys to share this with me as well. Uh, for those of you who are participating or also have already read this book or listened to it, um, but then you can contact me at info at wiseguyradio.com. Take care. Love you guys. Peace. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm sitting here with Josh Hamra out of Phoenix, Arizona. Awesome glass artist and uh, happy to have him on the show today. And how you doing, Josh? What's going on, dude? Oh, not bad. How's it going, Jason? Pretty good, man. Another beautiful day in Florida. Can't cannot complain. Nice, uh, nice. Got to yep. be got to be loving the weather down there. Yeah, man, it's a chamber of commerce kind of place right now. And then, like a week from now, it's gonna be back to 100 degrees. So I'm not no. not gonna get used to it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I feel you. Yeah, man. So uh, it's definitely an honor to have you on the show. I've been following your work for a long time and have admired it immensely. And digging, especially what you're doing nowadays too, like what you've been collabing with and the new patterns and styles you're doing. It's pretty freaking cool, man. So before we get into all the details about that, if you want to give us kind of an insight on kind of what sparked your fire with the glass blowing itself and interest wise, and then who taught you and where'd you get started? Awesome. Uh, well, it's, it's kind of a long story. Uh, my mother was a, a glass artist before me. She, uh, she was a core student at Penland back in, uh, 96, 97, uh, for, uh, metals. And she met some of the ladies in the uh, hot shop and kind of hung out with, some of those folks and got really interested in it. So she started uh, working with glass. Uh, back in like 97, she built her first bead making studio. Nice. So uh, while she was at Penland, uh, I was lucky enough to go up and visit and uh, they had just gotten their, their hot shop together there. And uh, so they let me blow into a blow tube and uh, make something that, people might call a piece of glass <laughs> and that was 97 but that's kind of uh that's a bullshit beginning if you know what i mean yeah, yeah. um my real beginnings would probably uh you know i would say in 2003 um i had a buddy who was a, a pipe maker local pipe maker um, needed a place to stay and he crashed on our couch and, uh, kind of set up a makeshift studio in our kitchen and, uh, started playing around back there. And, uh, I started watching him a little bit. He'd get me on there to play a little bit and made my first pipe, just pure garbage. <laughs> and, uh, I, I still have it. It's, it's pretty funny. Right. The, uh, the bowl hole was as big as the carb hole. <laughs> 
it's it's bad, it's bad, but it's still here. It's still in my possession. Um, so that was kind of like where I really got interested. You know, mom did did beads and all that shit through the rest of my high school years, and I did fish tour and loved the dead and all that. So, so I saw glass in the lot had my my fair share of glass pieces throughout the 90s and uh but it was 2003 is really when i uh, fell for the flame okay and uh it was all just kind of playing around and and you know nothing serious honestly and then uh a buddy of mine came back from bonnaroo that year and had bought some kevin o'grady marbles and uh, when I saw those O'Grady marbles, I nearly shit myself. <laughs> yeah. And and I looked at I looked at my buddy. I was like, "Dude, do you know how to do this?" And of course, he had no clue. And I was like, "This is what I want to do. This is it right here. I want to make marbles. I don't want to make pipes. I don't want to make big vases or blow big glass. I want to make marbles. I want to make shit like this." And and uh, so that's what I did. Nice. Like within. Uh, I'd say within a year of that moment, I had uh, gotten my mom's old torch and ordered some glass from Well Apparatus, who was like the place to order glass from back then. Yeah, yeah, fuck yeah. And <laughs> and uh, I taught myself how to do what I could back then. Um, no real formal training or anything. Um, no real formal training until around 2005. Uh, there was a marble maker, Harvey Carlton guy living out here in Mesa and I'd come out to visit my folks and, and they knew I was trying to make marbles. So they set me up with a little one-on-one with Harvey. And so, uh, he showed me a few things and we hit it off and then I, I ended up moving out here a few months later and, uh, took a class with him and spent a lot of personal time with him and, uh, and he's pretty much my mentor. Showed me everything I could I could ever know about making marbles. Okay, was Harvey. Yeah, it's important having uh, that 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 knowledge base like that from someone that's already got the experience. It saves you so much time. Oh yeah, he <laughs> you know? like he took me to my my first marble show. I think it was 2007, right right before my daughter was born. And there's like Travis Weber's there and Mike Gong. And, Christina Cody, Kevin Nell, I think might have been at that one. Josh Sable was there, and Gates and Recca. So it's like a who's who of incredible marble makers. And now a lot of those guys are making functionals. You know, yeah. it's, uh, it was just uh, it was crazy to see such intense work. And I was I was nothing at the time. I. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, trying to make spirals and stuff, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. And then I saw all these crazy vortex marbles, and it was it was intense, man. Like there's some uh, there were some seriously talented people uh, making marbles back then, and uh, I didn't even I didn't even know it. Like had no clue what I had gotten myself into, hmm. and uh, so I owe Harvey a, a debt of gratitude for taking me to those first. Marvel shows I went to, and yeah, yeah, it really gives from you a there, sense. From from that point on, it's been uh, you know a, I made a lot of non-functional work uh, for the better part of half of my career, hmm. and then uh, things kind of went to shit in all markets in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, and uh, so I started making pipes. And uh, had a love hate relationship with it for uh, for quite some time because I was raised with that mentality that making pipes was a, a lesser thing to do, right? And it was at the time. I mean, it, even even as as not far back as as 2009, it was a lesser thing to do. Like nobody put three hundred dollar marbles on twenty dollar pipes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, now they do. <laughs> right. 
But you, I mean, you, you, you know what I'm saying. Oh yeah, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. When I when I first started making pipes, I took a gig at a, a spot called It's All Goods mm-hmm. in Phoenix, and they had the the glass blower in the window kind of deal. Okay, yeah. And it's a, a smoke shop with a, a window that you could see the guys blowing glass, and that's where I learned how to push bowls. Hmm. And that was a, a kid, Jamie Pratty. Is that LQL glass taught me how to push my first bowl, and uh, I made a lot of really crappy spoon pipes back then. And I tried everything, not just. I mean, even back then, I was doing the hobnailed style work that I do now. Hmm. Um, that was something that I started doing when I was making marbles in probably 2007. And then I carried that style over to the the hand pipes that I started making at Goods. Um, insanely time consuming for a guy that's trying to make production. Yeah, yeah. And, I uh, so. so I tried everything I could to to not make those. Um, you know, so I tried little reversal pipes and everything you could try. Uh, the the fume tech that uh, that that air trap fume tech mm-hmm. that. Uh, Size love does, you know. I did a, I can't even tell you how many hand pipes I made like that. Um, and I worked for those guys for a couple of years and really got the fundamentals of, of basic pipe making down there. Um, but again, you know, I, when I was working there, it wasn't. I didn't. We didn't tell my family that I was making pipes. My folks knew, mm-hmm. obviously, but like. You know, we didn't we didn't tell it wasn't a an open conversation. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I know all about that, brother. Yeah. Um, and I still I still at the time did did bead shows and stuff with my mom. So, you know, we go to the bead shows and there's some, you know, reputable bigger name artists, uh, you know, guys that masters. Hmm. You know, the, the the guys that we've looked up to for years that are at these shows and like you tell them that you're starting to make pipes and they just look at you and, and throw their nose at you. Yeah. It's like nails on a chalkboard for them or something. Right. Yeah. Right. So it was just like, why they, you know, you'd get that, that speech of why would you do that? You know, or you just didn't tell them. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So yeah. My answer was, it, always, was, it pays the bills. You know, that was yeah, always, my answer. Yeah. To, that's to that's why. really what it came down to. Um, you know, I stopped making marbles for a while and started making beads because the bead money was good money. There were there were old ladies buying lots of beads, you know. And then uh and then when that kinda of died off with the with the market, um the only thing you could sell were pipes. Hmm. Yeah. It was the only thing that, that sold consistently. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like sex and drugs are like the two things that Will never have a bad economy, and when the economy is shitty, That's they get right. they buy they buy even more. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it spikes. Yeah, it's crazy. It spikes. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So, I mean, now granted, I sold a lot of shitty pipes for very little money through those times too. Mm-hmm. The mar- the market has changed over the last few years. Right, right. You know the the oil money now. That's being invested in the business. Um, yeah, you don't you don't have to make the the crappy uh, spoon pipe as much anymore. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but you know for you, I mean. you don't have to. But for those guys that are getting started, they need to be making those oh, sp- crappy spoons. You know, yeah. like it's it's. it's I'm kind of- talking. Sh- I am I am just openly talking shit about the spoon pipe because I just got done making a batch of. <laughs> That's really all that boils down to. I couldn't find a better piece to complain about right now. But you know uh, what, dude? Okay. You still you, you do what you got to do. Well, yeah, and I'm glad you're saying we that, got, man. Because we got a fucking kid on the way. Yeah, so exactly. Spoon pipes all day long. Yeah, man, exactly. Like you do some killer work, <laughs> you know. And and, as, and a lot of people out there Thank that you. see these guys out there that you know, all you cats out there that are making some amazing shit, and don't they you know they think that that's all you do. But really, behind the scenes, you guys are still doing your proto shit because that's what's paying the bills and allows you to afford to do the the ten thousand dollar art pieces. 
you know. Uh, and and not everybody can afford to shell out, you know, a thousand dollars for a piece. It's just it's not it's not that common. There are less people out there that can afford to spend that kind of money. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Uh, and so you need to have product lines that that will suit all forms of buyers. Yeah, exactly. You know, you've got to have something that's affordable for every man. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things I always preach, man. Have like the twenty dollar piece, the fifty dollar piece, a hundred dollar piece, the three hundred dollar piece, and the five hundred dollar piece, and then every once in a while I'll crank out a couple thousand dollar pieces, just because you can, whether you sell them or not. Yeah, you know? those. Dude, I was gonna say those those pieces could sit around for God knows how long. Mm-hmm. You know, and I can sell anybody can sell a hundred. Hundred dollar pieces. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's like before walking before they sell the ten thousand dollars. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. It's like I have a lot of friends that uh, I paint, and it always when I remember being younger and we'd hang out and I'd go to their house and I'm like, hey, who painted that? And it's like all their art on their wall is their stuff. I'm like, this should be out there being sold, but they can't sell it. It's not that it's not good art. It's just hard to sell art. You know, it's not an easy thing. Yeah. So unfortunately, well, with it's our, not easy you know, to price it. Yeah, and that too. Yeah, for sure, I agree. I agree, and it's all about That's environment the, and where you're at and everything else. Well, the, the worst part about being artists is that, that we're artists. We're not business people mm-hmm. most of the time. So, you know, you get these, you get certain artists that are committed to, to the art, and then somebody comes to them and says, okay, price that. Yeah. And you're going, but it's a piece of art, but, like, I put my soul in this, and... You know, I don't know what to tell you when you want me to give you a price. Well, how long did it take to make? Well, dude, I've been struggling as an artist for 12 years, so it took me 12 years to make that. Yeah, exactly. I say the same shit. <laughs> and, and it's like, so so you want me to, to put a price on my soul? And I sound like I sound like a, a typical artist when I'm saying mm. I know that. But, you know, <laughs> so that's that's difficult for people. You know, you're at you're literally asking somebody to to price something that, that it's just it's a foreign concept to most artists. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's that's interesting. A, but you know the price. I'm horrible of the, at it. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, man. It's, it's always it's that, and you know what I think with any business in general, like when you have a product of some sort, like I was listening to this show the other day, and uh, this clothing company. Uh, created a, a line of of uh, dress clothes, basically like dress shirts and pants and shit that's made from like sport material. So like you can go run in the shit and then take it off and throw it on your bed and then just take it off, take it off your bed and shake it out and it's completely wrinkle free and there's you know no smell to it or anything from the sweat. And uh, but long story short, these guys are trying to figure out how to price their the product line because it is a higher type of product. But they don't want to price it so high that they price themselves out of the market, but not so low that they're undervaluing themselves. And they went out and asked multiple millionaires, business people out there, like, you know, we're thinking about this price. And he said out of 100 people that he asked, 50 said it was too high and 50 said it was too low. So they knew that they had the right price. <laughs> you yeah. Know? But it's but you, it's it's always everybody has a different opinion about it and but like your production spoons that you made today you know the value of those things you know how much you need to sell them for to pay for the materials to pay for your time and you know that they can sell right as well and it's still not enough yeah I agree I mean no, I agree. I'm not I'm not going to deny that but it's still not enough yeah um what what can be made with the same amount of materials is exponentially different mm-hmm. like yeah I try it to... literally is it literally is the low end product yeah um you know if there's so much that one piece of prep there's so much potential with that one piece of prep and so you got to waste some potential every once in a while mm-hmm. yeah that's it's true. just the way it is man it's just the way it is yeah um Sometimes it's hard to sometimes it's hard to value those things. Um, but again, you know, they move. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you want something that's going to sell, make something you know is going to sell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like I always say, like back when I was even making spoons, like you're talking about. It's like every time I finish one, I'm like, oh, that'd be a pretty cool perfume bottle. 
but then I would make like yeah. <laughs> 50 of them, and you know, it's like I could have 50 perfume bottles, but if they're all pipes, I know they're going to sell. You know, it's always a right. difficult thing. But like you're saying, too, it's like it's hard to not think about the other things you could be making with this material that you're using to make this lower-end production stuff. You know, it's it's a, it's a fucked-up battle in a sense, you know? Well, you got to think about, like, branding and things of that sort. Like, mm-hmm. I'm working with, working with the guys out in Texas is really uh, kind of opened my eyes. There's so much potential in the pipe market that I haven't tapped. And the best way to tap that is to, uh, to offer a product that's available to anybody. Mm-hmm. That's how you build your name. So it's, it's just basically, you know, rebranding what I've done for years. Um, it's just, there's a, there's a much larger market for it now. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, man, there's no reason for that, you know, that we can't, especially those of us that have been doing this for as long as we have, that have the skill tech now and, and the mindset is, is along with it, you know, to know that we can make whatever more or less we want to make nowadays and not yeah. do it and make th- everything, you know. And if you get to bring somebody on to help you do prep and shit like that, you know. Oh, God. Boy, don't I need that. Oh, dude. <laughs> I, brother, I recommend it and... And I just did it. I have, I have an assistant that is now my apprentice. He came in and worked for me for 90 days, no pay. Was like shop bitch and wow. everything else. Sil- super killer dude. He drives an Uber on the weekends and during the week sometimes, you know, pays bills basically right now. But now he's also saving for his equipment. And, uh, right. yeah, dude, like we're, we've already kind of been going through the process of learning just how to turn the torch on, you know, just some simple shit. But, you know, it's, right. it's important. And that's how I offered it. You know, anybody out there that thinks that they would need an assistant, if you've been doing this shit for like a year, you don't need an assistant. But if you've been doing it for like five years and you're still going to the post office and you're somewhat successful, you're wasting your time going to the post office. You should have somebody doing that for you. You know? Yeah. That's how I look at it. And that's me. You know? Yeah, dude. But offer someone someone to come in. 90 days. Give them a 90-day trial. Like any job you have, no pay. Just come in here. You can watch me working if you want. If you can do my emails and my shit to the post office, pack my orders. Because that basic foundational stuff, just that alone, it was going to teach somebody skills that down the road, if they become a glass artist, they can take those same skills for themselves. And they also learn how to pack your your product for you. Because I'm very particular with how my shit's packed. You know. So just some thoughts. Nice. I recommend it, bro. Yeah, that's, it's, <laughs> it's not a bad idea. Especially with, you know, my time is becoming less and less free. They, having kids, man, it's why that was my main thing. I was getting ready to go out of town with my daughter for the weekend, and I'm like, I'm still up at 11 o'clock at night working my ass off right now. This is stupid. I should be in bed getting ready to go have a fun weekend, you know? So I put, yeah. I put the, the letter out there, now hiring. So, yeah. And like I said, I set the par- the parameters right away that it was not going to be a pay job. The pay was going to learn. Right. It was going to learn everything I fucking know. And you got a skill set, dude. It's so valuable. Yeah, you know, you just gotta you gotta that's, find that right person. That's, that's the hard part. That's another one of those things is finding the right person. Yeah. And that's that's something I've struggled with over the years is like, you know, finding somebody that I truly trust about mm-hmm. with what I do. Yeah, you know, um, beyond like having somebody in the future that can prep work for me mm-hmm. or things of that sort or even eventually take over things like the lower end product. Yeah, like your spins you did today. It's yeah, it's the the dealing with someone walking away with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, no, I agree. I've had it many, many, many times and that's why I didn't do it for so long. Yeah. Yeah. I got tired of that shit. And someone getting the like, Oh, I can do this now and then they think they're the best glass artist right. on earth after a week and then they're like, You oh, don't ever talk to you again, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Been there, done uh, that. That, and I'm not working in my own studio right now either. Oh yeah, that's that's definitely uh, makes it difficult. Yeah, that makes sense. Where? So, what yeah. studio are you in? I'm working out of uh, a place in South Phoenix called Holly Possible. Okay. And they have a, a production crew that works out of there. They make uh, hand pipes, and then they've got a couple lathe guys, and then uh, they rent out some shop space to a few other local artists. And uh, so I got my nice little cubicle and uh, and my headphones. Heck yeah, nice. <laughs> and then you also travel. Yeah, I don't. Around I don't and... Oh, go on. 
Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I don't. I don't force my hippie shit on on the public. <laughs> so I, I keep my headphones on, so nobody has to deal with that. Yeah, I've actually been hearing a lot of studios like that are going headphones now, just because of that situation. So everybody's got their own it's, shit now. It's, yeah, it's convenient, especially when you know your shop mates are listening to trap music. <laughs> Yeah, we and get you that want one. to listen, and you want to listen to the NPR and get your name. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. That's too funny. You want to listen to Alan Watts or something, and you got some hip hop in the background. Right. That's too funny. So, in uh, terms of your style, man, like like all your dot patterns and all that fun stuff, is that something that transitioned over from the marble text you were doing before, and that that whole time period that you then brought into your functional work? So, I seem to see, yeah, be seeing like um, that a lot more now that you've been doing. Well, I I was at one point in my early career, um, what is it, imitate until you can innovate, mm-hmm. yep. right? So at the early part of my career, I did exactly what everybody else does, and that's make whatever the fuck they can figure out how to make. Mm-hmm. And And, you know, there was, you know, the flow was, was in early print and uh, there was the glass line magazine. So, man, you, you pick up any kind of information you could find and you, you copied it. And so uh, that first marble show that I went to, I, I, all I had were copied, shitty copied marbles of, of stuff that I'd seen and tried to figure out. And, you know, that's that stuff that we're just first doing. And, uh, when I saw everybody else's work and how just amazing some of these guys stuff looked like it just was their own styles and, and it just it screamed their names individually, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh and I knew that I needed to do that. And so I left that first marble show and that's what I did is I tried to figure something out. And uh it was dot work, man. Yeah. Uh it's a it's a loose play on hobnail, which is uh it's actually a like a depression era type of glass, but mine is more of a play on Sue Ellen Fowler. Okay. Um she does the most fantastic hobnailed work and hers is just so pretty and pristine and every dot is perfectly in place and just fucking gorgeous work. That's called hob hobnailed? Hobnail. Yeah, one word, hobnail. Interesting. Um, I've never heard that before, that term. Oh yeah. It's like old old Yeah, I'm seeing it right now. Yeah, I'm actually just looking at the old old lumpy yeah. Like if you see the old lumpy stuff, it's that's hobnail basically. So like a lot of milk glass. Yep. Yeah, but... In the hobnail pattern, and it's just it's dots. That's all it is. It's dots. Um, but Sue Ellen does them in this just fantastic way. Of course, she's you know the godmother of boy silicate color, mm-hmm. and uh, so she makes her own colors. And her dot patterns are just incredible, mind blowing. Um, I knew that I didn't have that precision. <laughs> Yeah, man, that's uh, tricky um, shit. That's why that's why I appreciate your stuff because that's kind of what I was doing dot patterns. I was doing the yeah. intermittent kind of big ones with some small ones in between to fill in the space that I, my hand was just too quick or something. I don't know. I couldn't really get that perfect oh, honeycomb geez. look, you know. Nothing worse than connecting dots. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's just it <laughs> uh, makes you grind your teeth, and and like mine is mine's a hers is a patterned hobnail. Mine would be more of a chaotic or scattered hobnail. And it's just, uh, like I said, it's just dots. Yeah. But uh, I use like three or four different diameters. So uh, I'll start with the large ones and then come in and sandwich in smaller ones and then sandwich in smaller ones and sandwich in smaller ones. So I've filled up the area. It's it's fun. I, I don't know. I've been doing it for a long time. And... I even remember people asking me if I was going to get tired of doing it. I still have a burnout on it. So <laughs> yeah, man, started, I, it. I guess started doing that around 2007, so uh, eight years, and I'm not burnout yet. Okay. 
Yeah, especially with the the color nowadays, you know, like everybody's so into the transparencies and shit, you know, and the hype colors, which I understand. But mm-hmm. to work with mm-hmm. like your with your work, you know, you get into a lot of more of like the Amazon bronzes and the amber purples and you know all that fun exotic colors and the blue moons and the caramels. Oh and, yeah, you know, yeah, all the reduction colors. Mm-hmm. The old color changing colors that we all got turned on to when we first came to glass. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah. That was that was what attracted me to Bora were these colors that changed colors. Like you got a blue rod and you put it in the flame and now it's milky yellow. Well, how the hell did that happen? Or you know, like amber purple. How you could strike it out and get an entire rainbow of color. Yeah, exactly. That shit blew my mind in 2003. Yeah, mind yeah. blown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then we see where we're at now. It's like, man, it's, it hasn't even stopped yet or even slowed down, all this new color coming up. Oh, man, the the CFL stuff is, yeah. Yeah, it's fucking Wicked cool, right? cool, wicked cool. Yeah, man. dude, totally. Um, I'm all about it. The serum, the serum is bad as shit, man. Yeah. I've, I've had my hands on it. I've been really lucky, and uh, man, just what a what a cool effect! Yeah, tell me about it. I made a pennant um, for my wife the other day. I had a, my brother actually won a pound from Glass Alchemy that whatever their Instagram competition nice. contest. Yeah, he won a pound, and uh, so I was like, "So what can I do to get some of that shit?" And he's like, "I don't know. You can't have any. It's mine." Kind of thing. So he like kicked me like this little. Me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know you're my brother and all, but please. <laughs> So, so yeah, he had like a, a cut end off a, a tube pole that he had made it for himself, a little vac stack, and uh, I cleaned nice. it up. Looked like brand fucking new, and made a little pendant with. And it was like the over, like it was funny because after Jupiter and I did the interview, we were chatting the next day, and we both did the same thing where it was like I made the pendant that was serum, and then everything else was Illuminati accents all over it, and then I threw an opal on the on the center of the chest. And like completely hype pendant, like 100%. And he's like, yeah, I'm doing these flowers right now. That's like Illuminati flower petals. And it's, they have little cherries, but the cherries have an opal in the middle. And then it's all freaking serum all around it and shit. Like it was, it was pretty funny. Nice. Like super hype. You I know? made tops. Hell yeah. I, I love tops. your tops. Yeah, dude, they're fucking cool. Yeah, talk about tops. those. Wait, what was this, What's the inspiration that behind was, those? The, the old guy that taught me, uh, taught me how to make marbles also made spinning tops. Cool. And, uh, and so, you know, he showed me how to make them back in like 2006, 2007. And, uh, and then this guy, uh, Zach Cohen from Zach's Lost His Marbles mm-hmm. contacted me a couple years back and was interested in buying marbles. And, and then one day kind of ran a, a cross a, with a question, you know, do you know how to make? spinning tops and of course you know me being an idiot i said yeah of course i know how to make spinning tops i made over the last two years i can't even tell you how many spinning tops i've made it's been the i'd say the last two years it's been well into the thousands wow um i've burnt my shoulder out doing them Hmm, i bet so the the downward the downward pressure and the angle that you that you're doing the bottoms on them mm-hmm. um, has just totally destroyed my shoulder. So I've cut back significantly. Like it went from from making somewhere close to a hundred a month to like maybe ten or twelve. Man, yeah, it's and everybody listening to that. That's it's so important that like you're saying this, dude, because it's like that repetitive motion injury shit that we have to deal with. Like I was saying earlier, you know, I think before I hit record about my hand and uh, just from an old injury of stabbing my hand. But this, like at a point now where this long and 17 years almost doing this, it's really starting to affect my left hand grip and my twisting motion or like that, that pressure you have to use your thumb when you're marveling something like you're talking about your shoulder and your wrist and your thumb, all that shit. You know, it's like you're putting a lot of stress and strain on your body, especially if you're doing like a thousand a month, dude, that's crazy. Uh, yeah, you know, probably a, a hundred. I'd, I'd say probably a hundred or more pieces. Or, yeah, a month. A hundred a month. Yeah, and, I, was, yeah uh, I was off a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, you're looking at a thousand plus a year. Yeah. Um, Still, I can tell you that back in July, um, I was 
just about to leave for a trip out of town to work and was in a significant amount of pain with the shoulder to a point that I was worried about going on the trip to work yeah. and con- and contemplating surgery this year. And, uh, of course, again, being an artist with, uh, with no insurance, you know, having shoulder surgery is a quite a an expensive little uh operation yeah not to mention you're at work for a while then right then take the time off to boot so uh i put it off and thankfully i I found a an opportunity in late summer to like take it easy and rest a little bit and that helped significantly plus cutting back on cutting back on the spinning tops yeah I can move again. Yeah, good. I can lift my I can lift my arm. Yeah, man. I I know like myself personally when I go out and like work out in the yard. If I pull a weed weird, it's like that same like starting a lawnmower kind of motion. Mm -hmm. Uh, My left shoulder kills me. I mean, it's like two days worth of like I can't you know put my elbow past like my left nipple kind of height wise. Like I can't even bring it parallel to my body. You know, it sucks. And I'm wondering if that's the same thing. Like just like overuse i know when i was younger too i mean just falling down as a kid i mean shit like you know talking earlier we're getting our late 30s here so all of our childhood (laughs) stupid falling down and scraping our knees is now no longer a boo-boo it's shit fucking hurts now (laughs) oh yeah yeah and we don't recover from those injuries the way we used to that's uh there's no bullshit about that yeah i I bounce really hard now when we when we hurt ourselves it it lasts a lot longer a lot longer uh, I've yeah. been nursing this shoulder injury for the better part of a year. Have you looked into any kind of like massage or any of that kind of shit with it? Um, I've considered it. Yeah, you should. <laughs> yeah, man, find someone um, that'll trade you some glass, dude. Like, because like, yeah, I, you see, know, that's that's the thing. That would be the ticket right there. Yeah. Finding a a good doctor or chiropractor that would. Uh, would hook it up with the glass. Yeah. I'm sure you got some good massage therapists out there, you know. Yeah, you make a good point there. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure they're down with it. Yeah, fuck yeah. I would, dude. Because, yeah, like, I, 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 I go, like, really once a month. I never thought about it. Yeah, dude. Anybody I'm, out there that's I've a glass been, blower, you need to get a massage, like, at least once a month. You got to get it done. It's like changing the oil in your car. You know, you just got to do it. Yeah, true. True. You make a good point there. I, I've neglected myself in, in certain ways. Like, I've just been so busy that you know it's like well do i want to sleep or do i want to work yep. do i want to do i want to shower or do i want to <laughs> take a nap so that i can get back to work yeah so it's yeah you know it's it's definitely i've been caught up in everything else that i've let myself go in some fashion yeah, yeah, man, it's easy to do, bro. Like I, you know, it's, I, yeah. you know, something I, I, I keep, I hate to keep saying it, but it's things I like to preach about on here. It's like we've all got to stop and take a break. Like that's why I work in like three hour shifts, just because I take like an hour off after each shift and just a stretch or whatever, whatever I got to do. Like you're saying, take a shower, or take a nap, like take advantage of that that time in between shifts. But uh, yeah, the massage, dude. Like a, a buddy of mine, he would come to my house once a week, and he was kind of in in the end of his of his licensing so it was more of like his guinea pig on stuff but he actually went out to phoenix nice. and like his last part of his deal was like in this fucking cave with some holistic massage therapist and like he came back with some skills like he would like take my arm and like like put my arm or like if i was on my stomach he would take my arm and wrap it around his waist and then like twist his whole body to almost pull my shoulder out of socket but it wasn't pulling it out of socket at that angle it was like an amazing stretch that i would feel it go all the way down my back and it relieved like numbness in my hands I was having issues with, and it was all because of that. Nice. You know, because we're all like front, che- like upper chest muscle, pec, lat, you know, yeah. shoulder muscle strength, you know, and forearms, and then we get all out of whack because of that. And when, like the last massage I got, the girl was telling me she's like, "You're probably having numbness because your forearm muscles are so tight right now." from all that repetitive, you know, I've, I've rotated glass that was so heavy and so for so long, I thought my forearms were going to snap in half. Like the muscles were just going to yeah. pop like a rubber band or some shit, you know. But then I started going and getting a routine massage and it, I would not have that middle of the night waking up with both my hands numb or like 
my fingers curled into my palms like I've got arthritis or some shit. Because it's real, dude. Like, you know, the shit we got to deal with, it's like we're fucking ourselves up. And if we just maintain ourselves, what you got to do, man, you got to go get a massage tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Take a break. Go get a massage. Yeah, you got to. Maybe a haircut. Yeah, man. There you go. I haven't had one of those either. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I might, I might, take, I might need to take a shower tomorrow too. Yeah, Holy shit! Yeah, There's dude. a lot of things I need to do. Yeah, have like your own little spa day. You know, it's important. I mean, shit, I get it. What's pe- tomorrow's? I, tomorrow's what's tomorrow's Saturday? Yeah. Oh shit! Man. Oh man, I'm so behind on everything now. What yeah. the fuck? Every day, every day, Saturday. <laughs> you know, scratch, scratch all that other stuff I was gonna do. Forget <laughs> the haircut. Forget the shower. Time to get back to work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you no, know, I agree, dude. It's so crazy, like how fast the time goes by, too. It drives me nuts. Oh no! Uh, you've got two kids, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh man, what age? Uh, my daughter's sixteen, and my son's eight. Oh man, yeah. So you're nonstop going. You are on the go, nonstop. That's crazy that, that you've got the age difference there, because that's uh, my daughter's eight, and then. Uh, our, our son is due uh, November second, nice. so it's a uh, it's the exact same uh, difference in age there. Pretty crazy. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's huh. like, uh, yeah, having the older teenage daughter with her little brother. It's kind of fun. Can babysit the little brother, right? Yeah, dude. Actually, my sister and brother in law oh. now are at a point now too where they're like. All right, let's have Candace come over and see if she can watch the kids, like just for an experiment, you know, <laughs> so that they can actually go and do something now. Because like they, my all my cousins and my kids, like they they have a blast together, and they're a little younger. So about two weeks ago or three weeks ago, we all went out to uh, we had the Dolly Museum here. It's like the largest master's collection in the world of his work. It's freaking amazing. And they had MC Escher that was there as well. And I've never seen his work in person. Oh, row, wow. but Oh man, like they had his engraving yeah. blocks, like everything. But the only way we could oh, go, cool. yeah, it was fucking cool. But my daughter was like, you know, experimenting for babysitting during the daytime, so we could all leave, leave her with the kids, come back, see how things were, and it was perfect. So now she's gonna go nice. do the the first aid, uh, Red Cross, uh, uh, the babysitting class they have, so they can teach them all. Okay, that, all nice, that stuff, yeah, you know, which is important. That's she's, looking cool. Yeah, dude, for sure. And I told her, I was like, man, take it. Well, I mean, now make, she's make gonna now she's gonna have to charge you for that shit. Yeah, you know, I gave her twenty bucks on the I side. I mean, she's getting. She, Getting that education, yep. you know, taking those demo classes, you, know, you got to raise up a little yep. bit. She'll be, she'll be bumping it up 10, 20% yep. every time she takes a class. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I told her that because, like, there's a lot of those services nowadays that you, they like, you know, nanny.com or some shit, you know, these, these teenage girls that are making a killing and babysitting because they're part of this organization, you know, and it, I guess oh, it's Oh, hell like a yeah. Yeah, they thing, certify you know? them. Yeah. Yeah, they'll certify them and everything. So that's wicked cool. Yeah, yeah I can't cool. wait till Millie's old enough to start babysitting. Yeah, man, built-in babysitter, and they'll bitch about it, but you know, whatever. Let them bitch. Yeah, whatever. What do, they, what do they have to do? Exactly. I mean, really? Yeah, texting. I'll uh, just remind. Yeah. I'll just remind her of the first two years of her life <laughs> when she couldn't do anything. Yep. Yeah, my my sixteen year old still thinks that she's a three year old princess that wants me to wipe her ass and carry her to bed when she falls oh, asleep man. on the couch. My my little eight year old girl thinks she's your sixteen year old girl. <laughs> Mine was the same way. Mine thinks she's twenty five now. <laughs> uh, all of all of a sudden, all of a sudden, my eight year old is a tween. Yeah, yeah, it's funny, right? right? I I keep explaining to her that she's not even close to being a tween yet. She needs to back up a little bit. Yep. <laughs> yeah, man. It only gets worse from there. It's it's, it's actually quite oh, funny because I've got a sister that's eighteen months younger than me. So I've, you know, I'm not, you know, being thirty nine and sixteen, you know, my daughter, we're not that much different age wise. And uh, right, you know, it's interesting seeing. It's like, man, my sister did that shit, and I know what she used to do, and what you will do if I let you do it. So you're not doing any of this stuff. And now I've got a chassis right. belt, you know, with the freaking blowtorch and a fucking electrical system around it, you know? Nobody touches you. Hell yes. I'm not even Catholic, and I want my kid to be a nun, you know? <laughs> so, just like praying, praying to God yeah. that that happens. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, it's inter- it's interesting. But, you know, you yeah. seem like you're a good guy, you got good values and shit, so I don't think you'll have any issues. Uh, we, 
We try. And I've got a close family. The both of us, my wife and I both have, have uh, our immediate family. Well, my immediate family's out here. Uh, sister and parents and then my, my wife's family is like everybody in her family is here for the most part. Just about. So we've got this huge extended family out here and uh, it's just awesome. We, we're surrounded by uh, loving, caring families. Yeah, it's killer. Uh, so it's really cool. Yeah, that's yeah. one of the things that kept us here in Florida. So, I mean, besides where we live, is I love it. But yeah, we've got both of us have our family down here. Britt's parents just actually moved down back. They they've always come back and forth between here and Canada, but they finally are down here permanently. So right. which is which is cool. So yeah, it's it's a uh, it's gotta love man. I love big families for sure. Well, I can I can tell you, I'm not gonna die in this fucking desert. Yeah. I will not die here. You can't. You can't even dig a hole deep enough to bury me here. <laughs> so, you know, I, I definitely see myself somewhere back on the East Coast uh, before I die. Yeah, man. Hell yeah. So, uh, I miss it. I miss the. I miss the air and the grass, and mountains, and trees. Yeah, there's a lot to be to be desired. Yeah, desert life's got to be like. I remember we went to Colorado, and I was actually kind of su- really surprised by how dry it was out there. I, mean, I knew it was like you know Midwest, but I wasn't expecting it to be like that Midwest. You know, it was kind of a oh, yeah. little culture shock. But it was uh it's beautiful. But man, I I don't know, I couldn't do it. I'm Arizona about, you know, is it's gorgeous. Yeah. Arizona's gorgeous, but it's desolate, man. And you're gonna drive through three hours of fucking nothing to get to something beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and when I say nothing, I mean nothing. They yeah. don't call it the desert. Uh, yeah, they, there's a reason why they call it the desert. Yep. Yeah. It's because it's deserted. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, by everything, except for the occasional, whatever, scorpion and lizard. Sawara, sawara cactus, yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's brutal sometimes. But, you know, we're also the Grand Canyon state. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you start going up into the mountains and, like, Sedona and... Jerome, Flagstaff. There's beautiful. It's there's you know Ansel Adams pictures all around you. Mm-hmm. Essentially, I don't know if you're familiar with Ansel Adams. Oh or yeah, not, but yeah, he's yeah. The dude that took like every landscape photo that could ever be taken. That dude took it, yeah. and so there's no point in ever taking landscape photos. <laughs> right, <yet>. exactly. <laughs> Except we're all photographers now I on used our to iPhones. Be, I, I was a photographer before I was a, a glass blower. So, you know, never wanted to do portrait photography. And Ansel Adams did landscape photography. So what the fuck was I going to do? Yeah. And his was like portrait <laughs> landscape. Like he had the trees and the mountains posing for him in the clouds and the mist yeah. and everything. You know, it was like yeah. choreographed. In the, in the most perfect locale. Yeah, yeah. Did, did did amazing work and black and white. Yeah, do, exactly. Yeah, so. totally. And you know, it's kind of interesting talking about that because I remember being a kid and and just I've I've always been into art and been an artist my, like ever since I was like as I remember you know in a diaper. And I remember seeing his work and thinking about like always wanting to be a professional artist, but seeing that type of medium of photography. It was always very intriguing to me. Like I was like, oh my god, this is fucking amazing. But the fact that I always thought about too the fact that this is an artist who is making a living with his pictures that he's sending, but he's also marketing yeah. it properly. It's all being marketed, whether it's a poster or an original or a museum or a gallery or a hotel. You know, it's interesting seeing that type of artist back then, how things were marketed. And then you come to now and everybody's a photographer. He made photography art. Mm-hmm. That was what Ansel Adams did for photography. Before that, photography was just pictures, and anybody could take them with their Polaroid or their 35-millimeter point-and-shoot or whatever. But Ansel Adams took the, the camera and the film and made art with it. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's what he did. Yeah. And, and yeah, pretty cool. Pretty yeah, it cool sure is. Stuff. Yeah, it's all about composition, you know. And that's you know, yeah. kind of transition wise. That's why I like your work. I like the composition you have because even though your dot patterns are like not 
a pattern necessarily, but they are. You know, I like I like it. Yeah. It's, it's got a fun composition to it, especially the colors that you use. Well, thank you. Yeah, I've I've been stuck on the same palette for quite some time. Um, I'm just I'm really happy with the colors. They're they're time tested, and I've been able to find the the right way to work with them um, to suit my needs. And yeah, I mean, I I don't know what I would do without the amber purple family of colors, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. um, the mix of gold fume with those colors is, uh, phenomenal. Mm-hmm. And I get some of the coolest, coolest looking stuff out of that. What kind of gold and, are you using? Uh, are you using a 22 or a 24 carat? 24, yeah. 24. I just, I buy bullion for my little local jewelry supply. Nice. I've always wanted to, to kind of mess around with some other stuff like placer gold and, Ruby gold and all that stuff, but I've never, yeah, I've never really strayed from it. Yeah, hell Pretty yeah. happy with what I get. Did you hear that, uh, the show with Tim Pendexter, the kid out of Alaska? Uh-uh. He, uh, he's got friends up there that pan for gold, and he actually gets the gold from them, and he gets, like, exact locale and everything, the, you know, the whole, the... Oh, the, how cool. Yeah. So I was like, dude, you gotta take this gold and like make a series that's based on the locale that it came from. You know, it'd be freaking rad and just like name it that based on where the gold came from. But the fact that you can yeah, go out, you know, and mine your own gold is badass, dude. Yeah, that's wicked cool. Yeah, that's pretty stoked. So on your uh on your process with your sand blasting, um what what kind of medium are you using? Are you using aluminum oxide? Yeah. We've just always used aluminum oxide. Uh, Mom used it for years. So that was everything I I've know about a sandblaster I learned from my mother. Cool. Um, she used to do a lot of cold working and uh, sand carving and stuff like that. Uh, she did a lot of fusing and slump work, the large platters and stuff, and then she would go back and... Uh, Use a resist that she called butter cut, so it was a real thick resist. Okay. And she'd paste it over the piece, and then she she did freehand masking. Mom uber talented. Uh, she was a graphic artist in the in the nineties. I mean, she's been an artist all her life. I don't know. She she can draw anything but a steady paycheck is what she used to say. <laughs> That's a really nice quote. I like that. It sucks, but it, I, yeah, right. it's that life of the artist. <laughs> well, as a, yeah, and and you know, thankfully she had a she married a banker, huh. so she was able to to pursue her career in art for the most part. Um, she did. Uh, she did stop doing glass for a while. Uh, she cut a, a tendon near her thumb, hmm. and uh, and. I wouldn't say it scared her off of it, but she definitely had some some range of motion issues that she had to overcome. And she's just getting comfortable set back up in a new studio. So hopefully we'll see her progress in glass again uh, over the next year or so. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be cool. But I, uh, you know, she taught me she taught me all the all the stuff the any the ins and outs of, of working with the sandblaster maintaining it and uh i got lucky really um i didn't know what these colors were going to do when i started sandblasting i had no clue i just started sandblasting shit yeah it's interesting so i didn't i didn't know that i didn't know that blue caramel was going to strip down to a dark blue and leave like high yellows and oranges where I trapped dot. Yeah. Um, it just happened. And so I started experimenting with all the colors that I played with. Yeah, so I, I totally, man. I think what's fun with that, too, is it's like you can really strip away the reduction and see the true color outside the reduction when oh, you yeah. do that, you know, and it's like you really get a, an appreciation for what the real color was. And it's even different than what the rod yeah. is when you get it, you know. It's, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, it's wicked cool. Like there, there are some colors that, uh, you know, um, when I do my dot work, it's all clear dot. Okay. So I don't. I very seldom. I've I've done like some Illuminati hop ends. 
stuff or you know, mm-hmm. here and there, but very, very seldom. Um, pretty much everything is, is done with clear. So I'm using the, the actual metals in the glass to create the colors most of the time. Nice. So like the sandblasted ones, like the blue caramel, you know, I'm using clear glass and I'm just re- going back and forth, reducing it deeper and deeper to pull up more of the silver to trap. Mm-hmm. And that's what changes the colors in the dots. Yeah, exactly. So not all the, yeah, it's, it's wicked cool, man. It's a lot of fun to, to play around with stuff like that. Hell yeah. I don't, talking- ex- I don't experiment with colors as much as I used to, though. Uh, I used to, to try anything and everything I could get my hands on, but I've kind of settled into roughly about 10 colors and, uh, very seldom stray from them now. Mm. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. That's what it's all about. You know, the new colors I like, and I, I do randomly use them when they come out, because, you know, besides the hype, the fact they're hype colors and some, what people want. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'm the same way, dude. I have, like, I have probably, like, five colors that I've always gone to for almost 17 years now. And it's, like, the five original colors, <laughs> you know? It's like, fuck everything else. I'm just going to use a shit from 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah uh, that's what, that's me. I'm still doing the same thing. Yeah. For, yeah. Um, you know, and I know that eventually I'll get tired of it or that'll die out and I'll need to figure something else out. And I know what I'll do when I do it. Yeah, exactly. Like, I already, I've already been doing this long enough to know what the next step in the process is. So let me ride out this part of it for a while. Yeah. Until I'm tired of it. And then I'll, and then I'll do what I know I'm going to do next. Heck yeah. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, but sometimes sometimes you almost got to like kick yourself in the ass to then get to that next step because next thing you know it's like 10 years have gone by and you've been saying the same shit. You know? <laughs> Cuz I know I did that for a while. I was like, "Yeah, I'm going to keep right out this this distributor I had. I mean, this guy was paying me good. It was steady work, but then I sat down and like did the numbers and shit like 5 years later and I was like, "Whoa. I'm cranking out a lot of shit and my profit isn't good. My I'm stuck in the same rut of the same production, you know, like I like I need to go get a job and take a break for a little bit and then come back to it type of deal. Yeah. You know, but well, I've definitely definitely taken my break from glass. Uh I took about a year off. Um not not too awful long ago actually. So the break is still fresh with me. Nice. What'd you do? So I'm I'm just uh I just uh just took some time off. Yeah. And kind of uh figured out who I was and what the hell I was doing after a decade of blowing glass and not going anywhere. And, uh, you know, did some soul searching and, and figured out that I'm good at making glass. And so, uh, I decided after a little break to, uh, to continue to pursue what I was already doing. Yeah. So, yeah, it's but, cool. uh, yeah. I minimized, I minimized who was around me and I minimized the, the work that I'm doing. And, you know, I, I carried around crates and crates of old glass that had collected dust for years that was, you know, raw materials that I was never going to use. I ended up giving that stuff away and old equipment that I was never going to use, giving it away or selling it. So I minimized. Yeah. And, uh, and then again, you know, uh, kind of came back to the hobnail style work and just have been pursuing that and pushing that. I know how to do so much other stuff, but this is what I need to do now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's fun, this man. Is what, yeah. I like it. I like that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like once you, once you go through and you run the gamut of all the shit that's out there and then it's like, you have to backtrack and it's like, okay, let me repeat it backwards and see which one really spoke to me. And it seems like that hobnail style is what, is what was speaking to you. Oh, yeah. And it, and again, it's something that I've done most of my career. It's just uh, you can get lost in trying to do so many other things. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, you can, you can innovate so much stuff, but maybe now's not the time to, to innovate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe now's the time to to concentrate on one thing 
and know that know that that other project is there for when this one's run its course. Yeah, exactly. I got a buddy of mine that's kind of uh, getting his feet back in on his own as a glass artist, and he's he's in that struggle right now. He's he's kind of all over the place with like finding his spot and where he wants to be. And he was one of our guys at the shop, and we're all like trying to help him like hey man we, this is what we like what we think you should run with but don't do it because we say you should do it type of thing you know but uh, uh but it's fun because it's 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 cool to see him experimenting and learning new stuff and then going back to old shit and new shit and back and forth but he's kind of like hasn't quite nailed it down yet you know and that's the tricky my part. problem has been finding a piece mm-hmm. so i i do this really cool design but I don't have a piece to put it on oh yeah I know what you mean yeah. um like my buddy Shaba down in Tucson great guy great person to work with has a piece he calls a Shabler mm-hmm. and they're sweet and it's it's sweet it screams his name it's very unique and man he makes my work look amazing on that yeah, that was one of the first things I caught, when I caught my but eye. But they're his. Yeah, yeah they're his, yeah. you know? So it's, uh, I still, 12 years of blind glass, I still don't have a, a piece. So that's what I'm, uh, that's what I've been trying to work on for like the last two years and still haven't found it. I've been uh, yeah. I've been letting other people use the work to to make their pieces because they make it look good. Yeah, you know it's interesting uh, talking with Jupiter last week, and the, his little parting piece of advice was to find out what you're a nerd about or a geek about, and make your glass in that representation, you know, or whatever that that thing you're super excited about, and run with that as a line. Man, you know? I don't do comic book related artwork. <laughs> yeah, this is true. You are a comic book nerd. Yeah, that wouldn't work. Cold, cold Drink is a badass motherfucker when it comes to stuff like that. Ponty, those guys have it, man. Tess. Tess used to do some comic book looking shit, too. But, like, yeah, it's I give mad props to those guys that can do disc flips because if I really took my nerd life and put it into glass. That's what I'd be doing. Yeah. Well, too bad you couldn't take your your sandblasting skills that you got and do like some, you know, comic book. You know, some stencil. Or, you know, like I trust me. Books. I I considered that. I definitely considered that. But you know, then then you're running into the the slinger D rag. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's the best Long the Island glass. Of. Yep. Right, and that's that's where I immediately go with stuff like that. Or Gabe Halliday. Right. God, their stuff is fucking amazing. Yeah, I could never compare. That's something you should never do, anyways. Is compare. You know. Yeah, I um, agree. <laughs> man, that's a, that's like that's a killer. That's one that'll hold you back for years if you if you compare. So yeah, that's a tough one to overcome. Yeah, it's so true. So true. <laughs> yeah, I think you'll find it though, man. You know, you'll, you'll get it. Well, I'm, you know, I'm pretty happy with what I'm making right now. Um, I mean, not the spoon pipes, but whatever. <laughs> 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 um, no, I, I found this little. Uh, it's like a, a Sherlock style pipe called an acorn pipe. Um, I yeah. was kind of just. Wanting to experiment with some more traditional style pieces, and I still like to push bowls. I've been wanting to get back into old push bubblers and stuff, just because it'd be fun to redo them. Like you had a dry hammer I saw on your page that I really like a lot, the shape wise that you're doing. Yeah, and that Sherlock too. That might have been the that might have been an acorn style one. I'm not sure. Um, it's kind of like a, a half Sherlock, half almost corn cob looking piece. But uh, I really dig it. It's a slight bend in the neck and uh, a nice chunky bowl, kind of like an old, you know, tobacco pipe. Yeah, exactly. No, I and, think they're, uh, like, they're beautiful. Like the shape, the style, yeah. the composition of them. They're, uh, they're nice. Especially the one and I'm you... having, 
Yep, they're gone. I'm sorry. I'm having fun with that. I'm having fun with it. Yeah. That's something that I I haven't in a while. Like when it comes to making pipes, that's why I've, honestly I haven't been making pipes. Um, sitting down and talking with the guys from the baller section, it, it made me realize the other day it's been like two or three years since I would put together an order of hand pipes. Hmm. Yeah. Um, just kind of fell out of it. Not only not only fell out of it, but found other people that made pipes better than me make my pipes for me Mm. Mm -hmm. in a way that's that's kind of a weird way of looking at it but no i agree you know like there are guys out there that that make pipes significantly better than i do and they have their styles and i'm able to give them some of my work and they incorporate it into their work and it makes my work look fantastic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that yeah. sounds so weird to say, but, but man, like, like I said, those shovelers, yeah, dude, sweet. I'd, I had never seen my work like look that fucking cool. Yeah. So it's, it's really, it's, it's awesome when you're able to give, uh, some of your own work, something something that's recognizable as yours to someone, and watch them turn it into something beyond your imagination, beyond your skill level, even. And I won't I won't deny that. Like these guys have skills that I just don't have, and uh, and I thank them for sharing their skills with me. Mm-hmm. And I've I've been I've been really lucky over the last year, like I said, to work with a uh, just a a plethora of of artists here in Arizona, and and, and even able to stretch out uh, outside of the state and work with you know some of the guys in Austin, Texas, uh, at St. Elmo, like Salt and uh, J Mass this year, and uh, last year I got to go out and visit MTP in in Manhattan and spend a couple days with him and. So it's uh it's been nice uh and just all the Arizona artists. I, I try to get down to Tucson just every other month. Uh, the talent in Tucson is incredible, and it has been for years. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. Used to go down. Yeah, go on. I'm sorry. Oh, we we used to go down for bead shows when I first moved out here. And it was uh, it's just a huge community down there uh, during the the gym shows and stuff. They do bead shows, and you're looking at like you know, hundred, two hundred glass bead makers hmm. coming into town to hang out and and sell and party. And God, it's just great times. Yeah. Is there any reason why there's such a large community of artists there? It's kind of weird being out in the desert. You know, I think it's the exact opposite. Um. Well, you know, every state has to have an artist community somewhere. Mm-hmm. I would say Tucson is Arizona's. Yeah. Um, there's, it's you. You're kind of in a big city, but it's not the Phoenix big city, so it's not as rush hour and pushy down in Tucson. Okay. It's uh, a lot of it's it's old dirt down there. Um, so it's a little bit, I don't know, people would, some people up here would consider it grimier, you know, it's not as, uh, not as well paved. (laughs) And I think that, I think that's what attracts artists. So it's, it's less expensive to live down there and work down there. Um, so that's attractive for artists, you know, um, having the the gym shows and the bead shows down there every year um that attracts a a huge crowd i think they bring in well over a million people um during the the month that they do the tucson gym show wow that's awesome yeah i guess i could see how an industry would drive artists to move it's like whenever there's like a super bowl somewhere all the strippers in the country go to that town yeah yeah, it's uh, so that's I think that might be the draw. 
Um, God, there's, there's so many guys who used to live down there. Nady um, from Joint Forces mm-hmm. was dwelling glass out of Fathead there for a while. Um, then Calvin Nickel, Calm, um, Eugene used to live down there. Um, you know, you've got Margaret Zenzer. You got the the Sonoran Glass Academy has has run uh, a flame off down there every year for. I'd say the better part of a decade or more. So that's, that's an attraction. You know, it's one of the few, one of the few glass schools, um, around. So yeah, yeah Tucson's cool. wicked cool, man. If I, if I had my brothers, I would probably live in Tucson. Yeah. Yeah. It but like my daughter goes to, my daughter goes to school in Phoenix and, and she's happy here. So <laughs> that's the most important. So it's keeping, Keeping the kid happy. Hell yeah. Well, speaking of family time stuff, I was looking on your Instagram and saw your wife and yourself going uh, vortex hunting. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, man, talk about that. Because I've always, you know, I've seen specials on TV and different things about the the different energy fields and the, the like, it's kind of weird shit. And some people might think it's kind of hoity-toity or whatever, but uh, I don't know. I'm into it, man. I dig it. I definitely want to check that kind of stuff out. So what did you guys experience while you were out there? Well, we were we were lucky. We we got to catch some uh, a few different areas, not just the vortexes. I mean, there's there's so many different mountain ranges and and really just incredible scenery all through the the Sedona area, Red Rock Valley. Um, so we were you know we were just really lucky to 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 take as much of it in as we could for a couple of days uh, during our honeymoon. Um, the vortexes, my wife was a few months pregnant as we were trying to hunt those down. So we didn't quite make it to all of them, but there were a couple that were a fairly easy hike to get to and you get there and I'm going to sound like your typical hippie person when I say that you feel this energy. Mm -hmm. And there's no denying it. I mean, there's there's definitely some kind of imprint left in these places. And you can tell by the, the rock formations in the areas that they were gathering places. Mm-hmm. And so you can feel the energy of these gathering places. And it's, you know, it feels, I don't know, it's hard to describe. It really is. It's hard to describe. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's exhaustion from hiking in and not drinking enough water. Right. <laughs> but uh, you you get this uh, this somewhat euphoric, calming energy, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. Just gorgeous though, and there's not a bad view in Sedona. Yeah. Well, you know, Period. It's, it's oh, go on. Uh, it's un, unbelievable the uh, the rock formations and like they got a church up in the side of a mountain. Mm. Yeah, it's, yeah, incredible for yeah. miles. Yeah, the sunsets have to be pretty amazing out there too. I can imagine just the everything out there: sunrises, sunsets, the moon setting. I mean, yeah. All that shit. It's got to be fantastic. Absolutely. Um, and God, there's no light pollution there either. That's, that's the thing with Sedona mm. is they've, they've managed to, to keep the light pollution at a minimum. So it's just, it's stars. You feel like you could touch the stars from there. Yeah. That's an and, incredible uh, experience, huh? I've, I know I've been places like that. Like we went down to Honduras years and years ago and it was like that. It was like, oh, wow. It was just so fucking bright. It it was like daylight out. You know, the moon's out. All the stars are out. It's just, it was amazing. Yeah, it's incredible. And and three hundred and sixty degree panoramic views. Yeah. There, like I said, you can't you can't go to one location without seeing just breathtaking pictures. Don't do it justice. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, there's no there's no way of, of taking a, a photograph that can really bring it to life. And it's it's the same way with the Grand Canyon. You know, it's that's basically Sedona's like the ass end of the Grand Canyon. Okay. Huh. 
Huh. So part part of it runs down into there. It's the Mogollon Rim, is what they call it. Okay. Um, and it's just it's like an offshoot of the canyon. Yeah, I always feel um, the drive in there sucks. They're like it's boring as shit. Like you're saying for like three or four hours getting in there, but once you're there, it's it's like you don't don't want to leave the place. It's so spectacular. Yeah, it's a, a, the whole this whole area is really cool in, in spiritual ways. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of native history here. Yeah, you know, Ger- like Geronimo, uh, his camp was down south of here in Douglas. So there's been really cool, like awesome, gnarly uh, native history. And uh, there's, yeah, there's a lot of spiritual connection here with all that stuff. Yeah, it seems like it. I know I've, I've been watching a couple of these UFO shows, documentaries lately, and there's one of them that was, they were talking about <laughs> being out there. Yeah, they, uh, you know, we had the, the Phoenix Lights back yeah. in the 90s. Yeah. So, which there's, you know, all kinds of stories and skepticism around that, like the governor. Because now, like, one of the ex-governors has come out and, and said, oh, it's totally alien. Yeah, where at first yeah. he brought an alien on to the podium to talk. He's like, I, th- I found who it was. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Made a total fucking joke out of it yeah. when it happened. And now he's he's coming out saying, yeah, it was it was really in it. Well, yeah, man. So uh, to kind of move on forward, because we'll sit here and fucking bullshit all night, I'm sure. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, before we go any further, let's go ahead and take a second to thank our sponsors, and then we will get ourselves into the lightning round. Hell yes. It is said that at the very moment the sun sets below the horizon, a flash of green light appears called the Green Flash. This unique occurrence happens daily, but only seen by a few. Green Flash Glass chose this name to symbolically represent the unique beauty, simplicity, and good feeling experienced when using their product. Unique to the experience at sunset. Uniquely relaxing. Greenflashglass.com That was a quick break. So, uh, I'm sure you've heard the lightning round, how it runs, and it's a lot of fun, and uh, basically it's uh, half a dozen or so questions, and there are about 30 to 6 second answers on them. Feel free to expound upon them if you'd like. And uh, the very first question I have for you is if you could work with any living glass artist, who is it and why? Um, so I had a lot of time to think about this, and because uh, I've, I've listened to the show a few times. And it's like a super, super hard decision because there's so many like incredible artists out there. Um, not even, not just like boil artists, but like there's so many incredible soft class artists of like masters like Lino, mm-hmm. and, you know, and I mean, I could name, I could, I could probably write, write a list of a hundred artists that I would love to work with. Hell yeah. But I would have to pick somebody from your great state of Florida. Mm. And that's Robert Mickelson. Nice. Um, mainly because uh, I had an opportunity some years back to watch him uh, do a goblet demo here in, in Mesa, Arizona. And uh, he showed us how to do the foot, which I was having a hell of a time trying to figure out making a foot. And so I got to see him piece together this goblet. And uh, at the end, a buddy of mine introduced me to, to Robert and told him I was having trouble with getting a, a good foot and so he knocked the foot off the punny and gave it to me and said here now you got a good foot to stand on awesome and uh, and that stuck uh, now granted I still make a shitty goblet for it but yeah Robert Nicholson would probably uh, that was that's the name that stuck out to me Cool. With that question, and that's why, and that's why, because yeah. I'd really like to be able to show him that I've got a decent foot to stand on, not just the one he gave me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> yeah, that's a great story, dude. That's awesome. So, uh, what are your top five favorite colors in glass? 
All right, top five favorite colors, which I told you I've, I've got all of about ten of them that I use. Mm. So I'm going to go random here. Um, Mystery Adventuring, Blue Caramel, um, Amazon Night, mm, Double Amber Purple, and dark blue amber purple. Cool. Yeah, those are all fun. I love the amber purple family. Yeah, yeah, all of them. Absolutely. Hell yeah. Yeah, I, I had to throw a few reducers, a couple of reducers <laughs> in there. But for the most part, yeah, I'm, I'm all about the striking family, for sure. Hell yeah. So if you could assign the sound, if you could describe the sound of glass cracking in one word, what is it and why? Ouch. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's like getting kicked in the nuts, you know? Yeah. Or like, I don't know. That's that's the only word that you can use to describe it. It's not, it used to be fuck. Mm. That used to be the one word that used to be it. And then like somewhere along the path got zen about it. Like... So now it's just ouch, like, ah, oh, ouch, I got to figure out what the problem is, not, nah, fuck, my life's over, I hate this, I can't do this anymore, right, so there, you know, there, it took a long time to find that zen, yeah. that perfect place where, where your only response is ouch, instead of fuck. Hell yeah. The maturation of a glass artist. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so the shop, uh, well, you said it kind of earlier about being in the studio now, so I take it you just are uh, doing the radio deal? No TV? Or uh, TV in there? I am a, a strong promoter of the headphone. Uh, I truly believe that nobody should be forced to listen to what I want to listen to. Mm-hmm. And I... I just I can't, yeah, can't force my shit on other people, and I'm sure that, that they wouldn't mind, but I just don't feel like hearing it. Like, there's always going to be at least that one person that doesn't want to hear your shit. Yeah. So I'm a I'm a full on promoter of the headphones, and I listen to, I think I listen to a lot of talk radio in the morning, get the news, and uh, some podcasts, kind of get my day started, and then music and it's it's a variety of music and i'll go through phases where i'll want to hear like one band and that's all i'll listen to that entire day is that one fucking band Hell yeah! so nobody nobody deserves to have that put on <laughs> uh, you know? yeah, i'm sure they appreciate it I, I go on a fucking wean kick and then everybody in the in the studio hates it <laughs> you know yep right yeah, I had a good buddy of mine that we used to all work together, and we'd have Ween days. He was like a huge Ween fan. Yeah. He still is. And I love him, but I know some people are like, what the fuck is this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you get about you get about 10 or 15 minutes into that poop shift destroyer, and and most people are ready to just cut it off. Yeah. And I listen to some, like, I listen to some avant-garde jazz and stuff, so... Or, God forbid a, a fish jam comes on that's more than twenty five minutes long. Yeah, exactly. I, it's just it's like it, it's not a, it's borderline embarrassing in public. <laughs> you know, like I kind of want to run over and like I'm sorry, guys. You got you guys don't really need to hear this because then you're gonna judge me. Mm. You know, sounds like a nitrous trip on the radio mm. and everybody's yeah. You know, Jesus Christ, Josh, and you listen to this in your headphones. I don't want to hear that, yep. so I keep it to myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Fuck yeah, man. Well, for the final question of the lightning round, if you were stuck on an island, and this island could be any island you want, resort, deserted, whatever, and uh, all you had available for yourself was a studio that had oxygen, propane, a torch, and a kiln, what five items would you bring? I mean, I'm going to be really vague when I say glass. 
that that's that's going to be the first thing I'm going to need is glass. Now, I don't know if that means color or clear. If all I can have is clear glass, then I'm going to need gold and silver. So something to fume with, something to fume. So I'm going to I'm going to take glass and fuming materials. As to, um, I'm going to need some glasses. Because you can't light a torch if you can't see it. So glasses. I need a big fucking marble mold with a bunch of different sized uh, holes in it. So my marbles, big enough for me to flip over and use as a graphite pad. So it's like a two and one right there. That was smart. Where's like 10 pounds? That was smart. <laughs> and I'm going to, okay, so there's this tool called the... It used to be called Andy's Handies. Andy's Handy Tweezers. Okay. And they're, it's like a, a pair of tweezers that have uh, tungsten pokes on mm -hmm. it. Okay, so yeah. like, I you tweeze it together. Okay, so you tweeze it together to make like bells and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then the other side has like a nice little sharp rake. And the other side was kind of dull on the other end, and you could use it to do, like, air trap inclusions and shit. That's the other tool. That's five, right? Yep, yep that's it. I think so. I think that was my five. That was, that's like, honestly, that's one of those tools that, yeah, you got to have. Yeah, man, I did it. Of course, some tweezers. Oh, fucked up. Yeah, a lot of shit you could bring, oh, but those... Those, tung <laughs> those, tung those tungsten ones are the shit. I got a. I, I took a uh, class with Joe Peters and Peter Muller, and they both had a pair. And I was like, "Where the hell?" Are oh you man, those do? things are amazing. Yeah. And and the versatility of that, like, I love the the bailing mechanism on that thing. Obviously, it's the clean. It's the easiest and cleanest way to make a bail on glass, hands down. Mm -hmm. But the little the tungsten poke. And to be able to rake with that thing and do inclusions, like air trap inclusions and stuff. Oh, man, I love that tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah and they're nice because awesome you get replacements too. for those tips, too, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, oh, man. Yeah, dude. Awesome. Well, before we let you go here, if you can uh, give the audience any parting piece of advice and then also tell you how tell us how we can find you out there in cyberspace. Right. Well, you can find me on Instagram at hamstafam. That's uh, H A M S T A F A M. Um, and my work is available through uh, the Baller Section Glass Agency. Um, they're ballersection dot com. Um, that's really about it. Like, I, I'm lame when it comes to social media. I've, I've separated myself from a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, one one outlet is enough for me, um, and I have a hard time keeping up with that. So um, there's that. You, you, you could always email me. Uh, that is hamfamglass at hotmail.com. Um, and then as for like parting words or words of wisdom, um, I could spew a lot of, of those things. I would say, uh, for like you, the up and coming artists or the guys that are just wanting to, to get into the industry, um, just keep working at it, man. Like don't stop. Make lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff. Pipes. Specifically, I mean, to be totally honest, yeah, you, you can hone your skills making hundreds of different items, but make pipes because pipes are going to sell. And even if you make ugly, shitty little one hitter pipes, you know what? Somebody's going to buy that because people want pipes. Mm -hmm. um, and the more pipes you make, the better you're going to get at making pipes the better you're going to get at making everything else too because eventually you're going to be making things to put on your pipes and that's going to hone your skills in other areas. So before you know it, you're able to make badass marbles and you're able to make these wicked fucking cool horns and then 
you're putting those horns on those badass marbles and you're making pendants out of them. And so you make pipes and then make other stuff. But always, always, always continue to work. Don't take time off. Things move way too fast in this industry for you to stop doing what you're doing yeah. and do something else. Hell yeah, dude. Well said, brother. I think that I think that might wrap it up. That and respect your elders. Know where you came from. Mm. That's a huge thing. Yeah. Amen. Read some books. Read books, kids. Read books. There are so many great publications out there that can teach you more about this industry and more about the history of glass itself. Learn about where you're from. Know your roots. Yeah, and to put a little plug in there, too, don't forget you can go to audibletrial.com forward slash wiseguyradio and download your free 30-day trial and uh, audiobook from over 180,000 publications. <laughs> there you go. Damn right. Hell exactly yeah. what he just said. I was going to say that. I was going to pitch that, <laughs> and you took it right away from me. Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, man. This has been a blast. Uh, I have really, uh, really enjoyed it. I don't know if anybody will really be interested in hearing my redneck sound and ass talk um, for God knows how long, a couple hours or whatever. Um, but this has been a, a real treat. Um, and we're, I'm stoked to, to have uh, the ability to to gain knowledge through this uh, this adventure with you, yeah, thanks. Because I think that's really cool. Like uh, we've needed something like this for a long time. It's a great way for our industry to connect and communicate with each other. Um, and it's yeah, beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's an honor, dude, to be uh, to be doing this. You know, it's a it's a a passion I have. It's been awesome. All right, brother. Well, I will be uh, in touch, and uh, hope you all enjoy this episode for sure. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much. All right, y'all. We will see you soon. Thanks again, Josh. Oh, absolutely. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show. If you have any questions, comments, or remarks, please leave them in the show notes page area where it says comments. We'll see you soon. Have a wise night. You're listening to the Wise Guy Radio Show.